video today to review a new diode that I've tested out that was uh, given to me by DTR. It's the C-mount uh, 650 nanometer uh, 4 to 5 watt uh, laser diode that has been uh, talked about a little bit that uh, has some issues with respect to beam quality and some concerns about uh, the high price and whether or not it justifies uh, the cost. And to determine that, I've uh, tried to take an approach of looking at how the beam can be manipulated, take a look at what we can do with uh, temperature to affect the performance in terms of wavelength, and finally, uh, what can be done uh, to uh, estimate how much power it ultimately can make. To begin with, what I've done is I've taken the diode and I've mounted it on a uh, aluminum block. Uh, it's a C-mount diode, so it's face-mounted into the, into the side of the block. And if you look inside of this cold chamber, you'll see that the diode is glowing at the front end of the block, and uh, the light that comes out of the diode is going through this uh, optically flat window through a couple of lenses that I'll talk about later. It is being sort of um, estimated in terms of its effective width here by uh, placing these two stops to the point where I don't interfere with the brightness of the far field beam. This is not a very, very good way of measuring it. It would be better if I were to do a spatial filter, one of my techniques, and then measure the beam because we'd have a better idea of how much of this beam is in the uh, central core and how much is in the wings. The beam then will transfer through that aperture, hit this mirror, and using the retroreflection technique, move all the way across the room to a reflection on a mirror at that distance and then come send, be sent all the way back again to strike the wall over here so that we can observe it as we manipulate the, uh, the lenses. The distance is 520 inches from the uh, output of the lens to the reflection on the wall. So any of the dimensions we use can be used to, uh, you can use the 520 to estimate the actual divergence. Uh, some of the little details that are important in this setup uh, this I call the sled. It's the device that I've used to test the laser wave um, laser heads and uh, driver boards in order to keep them cool and have some sort of an apparatus to screw everything down. So I've commandeered it for this, this experiment. Uh, this block here, or this uh, PVC uh, plastic enclosure, was uh, diverted from a projector that I'm building for a show that we're going to be doing in about a month. And it demonstrates kind of a neat technique that anybody who wants to use uh, low temperature and uh, sealing off their diodes in a practical way, I think it's a good example of a, a technique that I really like. Um, a two inch high, half inch walls are simply glued together in a, a square fashion. There's nothing very technical about that. And then after the, they're glued, they're hand uh, honed on a flat plate with some grit until the surfaces, both top and bottom, are extremely flat. Then oversized holes in the four corners allow some threaded studs to be br brought down into the main plate. And then these studs retain O-rings. You can see the one up here. You can't see the one below here. But on the outside of the studs, these O-rings run. They're stretched tight. And then finally, a uh, plexiglass or acrylic plate is used to press down on the O-ring to allow you vision of what's going on in here, but provides a hermetic seal and access without necessarily having to remove the whole uh, chamber. I've used this technique multiple times in my um, projectors and it's refined a little bit in terms of dimensions, but this is a really good technique and it isn't difficult. The optical window that comes out of here is six millimeters thick, it's about an eighth wave and is uh, broadband anti-reflection coated. The two lenses here are cylindrical lenses, they're not aspherics, they're just simple cylindrical lenses. The interesting thing though is this is a 125 millimeter lens and this is a 100 millimeter lens, both positives. You'll notice I put the higher power lens farther away and the reason for that is because the output from this diode is quite a, uh, astigmatic. It's not just asymmetric, in other words wider than taller, it actually has two different degrees of expansion as, as a result you need two different focal lengths in the X and the Y in order to give yourself um, true collimation. One of the interesting things to learn about that is when we're getting into these super high diode, high power diodes, you really don't need to knife edge anymore. You can do this or use a polarizing cube to add two of these, but if you're down to the one or onesies or twosies, you can afford to do all of your correction with uh, long focal length 
simple non-aspheric lenses. You don't need the collimator as millimeters from these things. You can simplify the setup with just simple cylindrical lenses. And I think that's part of the reason I was able to get some pretty good results with this because I was able to get away from the radially symmetrical lenses and just go to the uh, X and Y axis cylinders. Uh, the setup over here, just so you kind of get a feel for what's going on. Yellow cord in here is the thermistor for the Apollo so we can measure the temperature as we cool this. This aluminum block sandwiches a two-stage Peltier cooling device. It allows me to drop the temperature pretty low. You'll see how that works. This is the power supply that powers the uh, Peltiers. This side of the power supply is simply the cooling fan on the back of the heat sink. This is the modulation voltage to the flex mount, uh, flex mod uh, driver here that's set up to four amps at five volts out of here. This is a six volt power supply that provides the current. This over here is a fiber coupled spectrograph that goes into the computer and if you've seen one of my previous um, demonstrations of the liquid nitrogen cooled laser you've seen this before in uh, sort of page two of this video I will be doing the effect of cooling and uh, the effect of um, uh, on wavelength of temperature and so we'll get into that when I have to modify some of these optics. So to start with uh, let me give you some of the dimensions. Um, if, we, if I take a meter and I think this black uh, English ruler is going to be better than the millimeter and you'll have to do the conversions because it has less reflection so you can see a little bit better. The spacing here if I can hold this without shaking too much is right about nine millimeters. It's three-eighths of an inch so you can do the, the calculations. The height of the beam here is about one-eighth of an inch or three millimeters. Um, you can kind of see this. It might be super bright on here, but a better vision over here on this reflection mirror is you can see that it compares to about the one-eighth mark. So that's the height of the beam in the vertical. And in this dimension, you can see that the beam is almost exactly one-half or 12.7 millimeters wide but that's at a 45 degree angle. So you can figure conservatively nine millimeters in width here. The beam then travels the 520 inches across here and then lands over on the wall with a dimension of slightly more than half an inch. I'd probably put it at about 15 millimeters. And here in the vertical, probably something like about, oh, eight millimeters, eight and a half millimeters high. Now one of the interesting things that a lot of people have is they've produced a squarer beam that doesn't have these wings on it. And I think that's part of the, where some of the law, a large divergence came from. If you're willing to spatial filter like I am, a lot of this, in order to pack this into this, requires a substantial widening of this. And I'll demonstrate that with one of these lenses. I'm gonna get myself out of the beam and if you just show, I'm gonna move this lens that you, you were just pointing at in a second, but I'm gonna show what happens to the far field image if I start to try to pack the light a little bit better in. You see what happens is, yeah, it looks neater, but the point is you've also spread out that central core. And if you bring this down a little bit and are willing to get rid of maybe 10 or 15% of the light, you can tuck that core in a little bit neater, and I think that's probably worth it. Uh, there's not a comparable uh, effect of narrowing here. It doesn't seem that the, the asymmetry of these multiple diodes that are probably the source of the light on this chip uh, they don't work the same in the uh, X direction as in the Y direction. So that's about as good as you're going to get with that, those parameters of the beam. So now what we're going to do is, I've got this thing right now running at about 2.2 amps. I'll run it all the way up to the full power, or at least 4 amps. And you can see that the beam really doesn't change in dimension. So this isn't a matter of like going more and more multi-mode. This is the dimension of the beam. In a lit room, it's pretty bright. Uh, at um, full 4 amp power. I don't think I would push this to 5, 6, 7 amps uh, because I don't think you're going to gain that much more and if anything you're more likely to blow out a three or $400 diode. You'll see that the base temperature right now is 24.2 degrees and that's going to be important for the next page on this video. So I think what I'll do is I'll take a break right now and I'll get back and we'll take a look at what happens with the uh, wavelength with temperature variations. Hi, welcome back. Uh, what I decided to do is uh, set up this laser in order to be able to do a spectrum uh, analysis. And so I removed the aperture and I replaced uh, that area with a couple of simple microscope slides, uncoated, each one of which reflects about 5% of the light. So by using two in series, I reflect about a 20th 
times a 20th of the light or about 1 400th of the light over to around the area where the diode of the fiber is. That low sampling still required that I turn the power down a little bit because I didn't want to oversaturate the CCD in the spectrograph. And as you can see here, this is an example of the spectrum. Uh, these are actually from the fluorescent lights in the room. This is the spectrum of the laser diode. And if I put my finger in front of the beam right here, you can see me make it disappear. You can also see there's two peaks close to each other. I could expand, ex spread this out, but you get the point. There's probably multiple emitters on this um, chip, on this uh, C-mount diode. And so as a consequence, we're probably seeing, and if I brought this out, probably you would see as many as there are, uh, slightly different wavelengths for each one of the different emitters, and that's why you're seeing a double peak. The important significant thing here, and my disappointment, was this wavelength. You can see here, this thing is listed at 661.82, almost 662 nanometers. This is a very good spectrograph. I've calibrated this against a helium neon laser at a couple points, green and, and uh, red orange. It's within a nanometer of accurate, so the, the spectrograph is pretty good. This is real. And so rather than the 650 that these are ad advertised to be, 660 is substantially more red. It's about half as visible as at 650. And as a result, whatever temperature you run this at, and we'll get into this, you're going to be running 10 nanometers redder than you would be if this was starting at 650. The other thing I would just mention before we get into the cooling is that these diodes are a little unusual. And if you look below here, you'll see there's a black wire hanging out of the bottom. These things are case positive. So this entire apparatus here is actually charged with about three or four volts. And the ground is the isolated uh, lead from this diode. So that's unusual. Something to keep in mind if you ever do buy one of these things. Make sure that you don't uh, wire them up inverse. Um, all right, now the temperature effect. As you can see, 20, 24 degrees centigrade, about 661 nanometers. I'm going to turn on the power supply to the Peltiers. Now, these are pretty efficient because they're two-stage, but I don't want to keep you here forever. And so even at this uh, low power level, about 2.4 amps, this thing will get down to about zero degrees centigrade. So I'm going to up the power a little bit so this thing moves a little faster. We'll bring it up to about four amps. And you'll see with about 18 watts going in, about four, uh, four amps, this thing will start to drop. And as it does, we'll watch what happens here. Two effects. One, you can already see that the power is going up, and it continues to do this. The diode loves to run cool. Uh, the cooler it is, the more powerful it is. So what I end up having to do is you'll watch, I'll have to actually turn the power source down a little bit so I don't oversaturate the CCD and so I can kind of keep it visible um, on the screen within the limits of the, um, uh, the screen. Uh, anyway, also you can see that the peak is beginning to move a little bit to the left and it's beginning to blue shift. The temperature now you can see is about 18 degrees centigrade. And as it continues to drop, the wavelength will continue to shift to the blue, the power will continue to shift up. I've had this thing down to about zero degrees and this process continues. It stays um, bi-peaked, uh, but the average moves down together. And what we'll, what we'll see is that with this diode, it's following the same pattern as all the aluminum gallium arsenide diodes, which is about a quarter of a nanometer per degree centigrade at the warmer end of its range uh, in terms of redshift, blue shift. Uh, that's what I found with uh, the old uh, diodes, the, uh, the old CD burners. Uh, I found it with the Mitsubishi diodes. And it's far more shift than you will see with the gallium nitride diodes, which is in the greens and the blues those shift about a 20th of a nanometer per degree centigrade. You're not going to color shift those things effectively, but you may see a substantial increase in power. Uh, I think what we'll do is we might want to hold for just a second uh, on the camera. We'll come back in just a minute or two after we've brought the temperature down a little bit more. It's been a couple of minutes now and uh, the temperature's dropping. We're at about minus 12 degrees centigrade. And if you look over at the screen, you'll see that we've continued uh, to shift down towards 650. If I click on here, remember it was 662 to begin with, and now we're at about 654. So we've dropped about 8 nanometers. And I suspect if we went a few more degrees, we'd probably hit about 652. 
which is close to the advertised, but not close to what you could achieve with good, uh, with good cooling if we started at 650. So now page three is gonna be just the power output. What can this thing do if you brought this thing all the way up to four amps? And I'll bring out the power meter for that. Now you can see that the temperature has stabilized down at about minus 18 with an input of about 50 watts into the TECs. I've set it up so that I've removed any of the downstream equipment except for a power head here that plugs into the Ophir. I'm just barely above threshold right now and so there's about 80 or 90 milliwatts coming into it and you see a little bit of glow. The asymmetry you see on the screen is simply because there's a lot of wings and a lot of noise. These things are going to need spatial filtering. But the bulk of the central core that if I were to move this out of the way and take a look at the wall over there, you'll see the bright spot. That's the beam that effectively if you were to go a long distance would look like what you saw on the wall before. But now we're going to just intercept it with this head and measure the power output. So now the question is going to be as I go up, this modulation is such that as the uh, modulation is brought to say about one quarter of full power, the power uh, level goes up to about 0 0.4, 0 0.43 uh, watts. As I bring it up to about half power, which is about two amps, you can see that you're getting about 1.45 watts out. If I bring this up to about 80% modulation, you can see that the power is now at about 2.4. And if we bring it up to full modulation, you can see that the power is upwards of about 2.06, 2.3. Seven. Um, as I move this around a little bit, you might see the dance a bit, but 2.7 watts output at 4 amps of uh, input current. I could see that, as, because this seems relatively linear, that if we were to go up to 5 or 6 amps, you might be able to hit 3 and a quarter, 3 and a half uh, watts coming out. But the problem, as I stated before, is that even though this is probably twice as powerful as one of the Mitsubishi diodes effectively on my apparatus, um, it's also about one-third is visible. So with the difficulty of maintaining this, uh, a good optical output with these lenses, the difficulty of dealing with the longer wavelength, and the relatively not uh, incredibly high powers, um, I'm not so sure that this diode would be something that I would use in any of my projectors. Uh, the only advantages I can see is that it's certainly in the one axis, the x-axis, it produces a very, very good beam. And it appears that the y-axis, which is probably the uh, axis that has the multiple emitters, uh, does not produce the same kind of quality. And it's very difficult to achieve better than what I've done probably here by using simple lenses. So that's my review. Um, I don't think there's anything more that I would do with this other than try to push it even harder. But I'm not so sure at that price it would be worth it to see if you could get three or four watts out of it. Um, hope you enjoyed it and look forward to seeing you next time.